Pierre Polyev has threatened a vote of no confidence if the Liberals refuse to back down from their planned carbon tax increases. This is unlikely to result in an election, but what would it mean for firearms owners if it did? Let's have a look. Welcome back to the channel. So today we're going to be looking at some very interesting news out of Parliament. As I'm sure a lot of you have already heard by now, Pierre Polyev has threatened for a motion of no confidence today in Parliament if the Liberals don't back down from their planned carbon tax increases. Whether or not that actually happens still remains to be seen. That should be happening later today if he does it. He has promised to do it, and I'm, I'm kind of excited to see where this goes. But if we're being honest, I don't think this is actually going to result in an election. I think this is more of a political move. And, and I think it's a pretty good political move for what it's worth, because there's really only three ways this can go. So one, Trudeau could end up backing off of his carbon tax here, off of the 23% increase, I believe it is, that's coming on April 1st. Now, realistically, I don't see that happening. And the reason for that is because this is kind of like the last thing the Liberals have going for them. They have failed on basically everything in the last few years. They failed on housing, they failed on public safety, they failed on finance and economic... Like, they've just failed on basically every measure that a government is supposed to provide for. And any time that they're questioning all of this, their, their ultimate fallback is always, well, don't worry, we're fighting climate change. We're going to fix the climate crisis with our carbon tax. So you can't realistically expect them to back down from the one thing they have going for them. And even that's going extremely poorly for them. 70% of premiers are against this carbon tax increase, and over 70% of Canadians are also against this carbon tax increase. So even the one thing, their one fallback plan to save the world and save the climate and everything, it's, it's just not working for them. And it's the very thing that's leading to this non-confidence vote. Number two, and this is the most likely outcome, and the most obvious outcome, is the NDP and Liberal Coalition, they're just going to shut this down. They're just going to vote against it, it's not going to have enough votes to pass, and that's just the end of it. But even that's beneficial for the Conservatives. Not only will this give them political leverage, but it'll also sour the voter base against the NDP and against the Liberals. Even among NDP and Liberal voters, the carbon tax is a fairly unpopular policy. So... Putting it on full display that absolutely, without a doubt, the NDP and the Liberals are completely all in, no ifs, ands, or buts on the carbon tax, will cause them to lose votes in Canada. So that's just, in and of itself, a win for the Conservatives. And then number three, the least likely outcome here, is the non-confidence vote could just actually work. Uh, wouldn't that be something? Now, realistically, I don't see that happening, but it's not as far-fetched of an idea as you might think it is. This is the current seat distribution in the House of Commons, and if you take a look at the total Conservative, Bloc, Green, and Independent seats, if all of those parties go all in on this non-confidence motion, which would make sense for them to do, that's a total of 155 seats. And in order for any motion to pass in the House of Commons, you only need 170, which means we're only missing 15 seats. Now that, that's actually quite a bit, but it's not as many as you would think. That is easily within reach, for the NDP to just flip on this and every party goes against the Liberals and we have ourselves an election. But not only that, we've had a number of outlier incidents in the last year where individual members of both the NDP and the Liberals have spoken out very vocally against their party or have gone against the grain of their party wishes on certain bills and on certain policies. If you remember back in SECU during C21, uh, Alistair McGregor actually saved us from G4 and G46. It was a lot of political pressure from conservatives and a lot of campaigning from the CCFR and a lot of a lot of good work by everybody all around, but ultimately it came down to the vote of an NDP member, Mr. Alice McGregor, who really saved us from the crap that was in G4 and G46 and really caused the Liberals to take a step back on their gun control measures. And even in this year alone, we've had multiple Liberal ministers speak out very vocally against their party so at the very least, we can see that there's at least three people who are willing to go against the grain of the party in order to stand up for what they think is right, even just a little bit. Whether or not they'll do that in practice on a vote in the House of Commons, eh, I'm, I'm more doubtful of that. But it wouldn't take much. 15 seats sounds like a lot, but it's actually less than 10% of the combined seats between the Liberals and the NDP. So that means if just one in 10 of those ministers stand up and have a backbone and say, you know, enough is enough, this is getting ridiculous. That's all it would take. And that's that's not that much. So you combine people like that, along with just the natural nature of politicians, you know, there could be some ambitious power hungry politicians in the Liberal and the NDP caucuses who are thinking, you know, this is their time. If there's an election called now and Trudeau gets ousted as leader of the Liberals and 
Jagmeet loses popularity in the NDP for all his failings, you know, maybe those parties could encounter a change of leadership and maybe that's the time for somebody to jump themselves to the top. So you never know how these things are going to play out. Realistically though, on the important matters in Parliament, it is extremely rare for anybody to break party lines and non-confidence votes are about the most important in, in Parliament. So I, I don't really see this going any other way. It's most likely that they're just going to have it tomorrow. The NDP Liberal Coalition is going to shut it down and that's going to be that. As much as I'm happy that there is a non-confidence vote going on, I'm kind of disappointed on the topic. In my video I released about a month ago on the Emergencies Act, which you can watch here, in that video I expressed my, my frustrations with how callously and willy-nilly the government, particularly the Liberal government, but also the courts in the case of the Freedom Convoy, from Rouleau to even Mosley, the, the justice who actually handed down our favorable ruling, they, they all kind of treat our rights and freedoms as a very trivial thing. And in that video, I directly said that, the, you know, this is good grounds, or at least in my opinion, excellent grounds for what should be an unconfidence vote. If not now, then when? If not when the government is taking away your absolute most basic fundamental freedoms, calling you dangerous extremists, freezing your bank accounts, and sending you to jail without trial for years? Like that's, that's crazy. That is absolutely crazy. So for me, it was like, if not now, when are we ever going to have a non-confidence vote? And turns out a tiny tax increase is, is when we have the non-confidence vote. That's, I mean, whatever it takes, I'm happy, but that's very disappointing in a lot of ways. Like a 23% increase on the carbon tax is not a remarkable amount of money. The whole tax framework for the liberal government, yeah, that's killing Canada, but a 23% increase on one of the taxes is not honestly that much money even for everyday people. I, I'm not, <laughs> myself, I'm not rich. I'm not a fan of the carbon tax. That stuff needs to go. That like it, taxes need to come way down across the board. And actually for my job, I consume a lot of gas. I drive for a living. So taking the carbon tax off of gas would be a dramatic reduction in expenses for me. So I don't want anyone here thinking that I'm saying that the carbon tax really isn't that bad. What I'm saying is the, the total cost of gas, only a portion of that is the carbon tax and only a very tiny portion of that is increasing. So it's going to be more money, but it's not a ludicrous amount of money. And if I had to balance my frustrations of a little bit more money at the pump and the government eradicating my rights and freedoms, I'm choosing this one. This one is it's far more important to me than a little bit of extra money at the pump. But the method's really not all that important. What matters is that it's happening and I'm excited. I'm excited to see how today will go. So what does this all mean for firearms owners? If this does happen and we do have an election, what happens when the conservatives get in? Well, first off, the good news is we get off the chopping block and we can take a breath and breathe and relax and, you know, just have a sigh of relief and the crisis is over. Wouldn't that be nice? We've been in the line of fire for years now and it would just be good to be able to relax and not have to worry and not have to check the RCMP website every morning I wake up to make sure that I'm not a criminal today. These would be good things to have and I think we could probably all agree on that. But in particular, what that would mean is we don't have to worry about any new OICs that are coming and we don't need to worry about their potential magazine changes that they've announced that they're planning, but we don't really know what they're going to be or when they're going to land, which I also have a video on you can see here. And if the Conservatives get into power, they can actually stop a lot of the changes from C21 that haven't actually come into force yet. A number of the changes from C21, including their current yellow flag provisions, have yet to come into force and they are expected to come into force via a order in council. And if the Conservatives get into power, they couldn't just overturn those rules on a whim because they're enshrined in law, but they could effectively put those policies in purgatory by ensuring that they never receive the order in council to come to effect. Now, a lot of C21 has already come into effect. You know, the hand, handgun freeze is already here and that's here to stay. Without enacting new legislation to overturn it, that's going to be difficult. And when it comes to the 2020 OICs, uh, things don't get much better. Originally in my first C21 video, I said that when the Conservatives get back into power, they'll just be able to OIC things back. And it turns out that probably isn't the case. Where I kind of got confused was C71, not C21, this is a different bill, C71 that was passed back in 2019. Some of their provisions came into effect in December last year in lockstep with C21, and that actually reduced the ability to lower the classification of firearms once they're prohibited. So for anyone who saw that video, I'm sorry, I think I gave you some bad information there. Um, that, that's a pretty big mistake to make. I shouldn't have made that mistake. I'll have to slow down a little bit and study what I'm looking at a little bit more in the future. Um, I do plan on making a part two for the C21 video, so I'll make sure to include this correction in that video, as well as going back to the C first C21 video and 
updating the description and maybe even pulling those parts of the videos out, like just chop them out of the video if I can, uh, make those corrections because that's, that's a pretty big mistake to make and that's an unfortunate uh, promise in a way that I made you guys. So I am sorry about that, but I'm going to have to, I'm just going to have to fix it and move on and be more careful in the future. So sorry about that and we're going to have to move on. But all that being said, not all hope is lost. If there is an election called tomorrow and in a month we have an election, Conservatives are going to have a massive majority and they should be able to push through a lot of legislation. How much of a speed bump the Senate wants to be and how much of a nuisance they want to be, we'll have to see. I think there's a lot of liberal sympathizers and a lot of Trudeau supporters in the Senate and I think that'll cause some problems. But it's not like they'll be able to block all legislation for the Conservatives for the next four years. They, just, they also don't have that kind of power and that kind of influence. But even on top of that, the CCFR is currently appealing their court case, and if they win that court case, the judge can and will overturn the 2020 OICs. That's actually exactly what they're discussing, among other things, but that is one of the contentious points. I'm currently actually going through the CCFR's court case. I'm trying to read up on it and study it, and probably going to make a video on it in the next month or so. But even already, I'm only about halfway through it making notes and stuff. But even already, I can see some very obvious, obvious instances where the judge in that case showed some pretty significant bias. I'm not entirely sure if that bias was intentional, whether it was, you know, contempt for firearms owners or anything like that, or if it was just ignorance, if the judge just doesn't know any better. And like a lot of people, the judge knows what they know about firearms on, based on stuff on the news or based on what they see on TV or in Hollywood. They don't actually understand anything about firearms or any terms or anything like that. So I'm, I'm not sure if it was intentional bias or unintentional bias, but the judge made some very clearly poor decisions and poor categorizations from what I've been able to see already, and I'm only halfway through it. So, so I think an appeal has a pretty fair chance if they get a sensible judge, but I don't know, <laughs> I don't know how many sensible judges there are out there, but, but I'll get into that more when I actually make that video. So if an election doesn't happen, when is it going to happen? Uh, well, I think, I think there's two obvious answers. One, we have to wait till next year and we'll have it in the fall of 2025, like it's scheduled to happen and that's just that, but it could also happen sooner. Polls are a fickle thing, and voter interest is a fickle thing. Like, it feels like we've been riding this Polyev surge for, you know, a year now, and we're just waiting for Trudeau to get the hell out of the way. But if you actually look at the polls, the actual polling numbers, we've really been only on this surge for five or six months now. Like, he's only really pulled away from the Liberals in the last half year or so, if that. And, and who's to say where he'll be six months from now? Like, we're going to have... I think a pretty rough fire season this year. A lot of places didn't get a lot of snow. Alberta's already started their fire season. Uh, we could have another really bad fire season and that might cause some people who are sympathetic to the climate vote to jump ship from the conservatives, the evil conservatives who hate the world. And that might pull some support away from him and back into Trudeau's hands. And he probably won't win the next election no matter what he does, but if he feels like he can snipe a minority election and take a majority away from the conservatives, they might pull an election then in order to handcuff the Conservatives into being into a minority government for four years. And a lot of minority governments in Canada, they don't make it their full four years. Something happens and they get ousted. So that's what I know. Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to this vote. I want to see how it goes. Like I said, I'm pretty sure it's not going to work out, but I am interested to see how it shakes out, what the fallout of this is going to be. But all in all, I'm pretty excited to see what might happen later today. I'll try to keep you guys updated as I can. I do have a Twitter now if you guys want to follow me on Twitter. I don't know how active I'm actually going to end up being on Twitter. We'll have to see how many people actually show up there. I don't use it personally. This is just going to be a Twitter account for the channel. So I, <laughs> this is my first experience, or, or X, it's called X now. This is going to be my first experience on X. So show me the ropes, share some stuff to my profile if you guys can. And I'll try to keep you updated both there and as well as the description of this video if you guys want to come back and get some updates. All that being said, thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one. It says that anywhere in the regulations where a firearm... What exactly does it say? Oh, no. They probably won't be able to be oic back. Hmm. Crap. Actually, now that I read that... Any firearm that is prescribed to be a prohibited firearm. Oh, shit. That actually doesn't mean what I thought it means. Interesting. Maybe we can't then. Huh, that's sad. That is not what that means then. Hmm. Damn!